Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. And it's, of course, uh, very special to be able to have alums coming back, to see our faculty, and of course, to see all of our students, but also friends of the university. So w welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really, this is plugged into energy research uh, lecture. And this evening, we are fortunate to welcome three very special guest speakers to the University of Rhode Island, Pat, Timmy, and Kevin. I guess we go by first names here, and uh, I'm Mark, and uh, who you'll meet in a minute. And they're joining us from Louisiana with their spouses to spend an evening and much of the day tomorrow with our campus community. Uh, we're really honored to have you on campus to share your story with our students, faculty, staff, and members of the community and beyond. And for uh, Pat McShane and his wife Stephanie, this is a homecoming of sorts. It was here at URI back in the 80s. Um, they got to know each other as undergraduates studying marine affairs. And then between busy careers and raising a family, I understand it's been quite some time since they were here on campus. So. A big welcome back from all of us here at URI. Yeah. And I, I also want to thank Marissa Quinn, uh, who brought the CBS 60 Minutes segment about Taylor Energy oil spill to my attention. So thank you, Marissa. Uh, So Marissa is an alum, a friend of the university, a friend of the president, and uh, so we have her to thank for our three as seen on television celebrities here uh, tonight. Um, but before I turn the program over to this evening's moderator, Dennis Nixon, I, I wanna say a quick word about the importance of lectures like these. First of all, um, we, we have a number of uh, opportunities for the community to come together, and I really think that they connect to the greater work we are doing at URI to address global challenges, everything from climate, energy, sustainability, and support our mission to be a leader in the blue economy. The blue economy is more important now than ever because it requires us to think strategically about both how we protect and use valuable resources of our oceans and waterways. At URI, we are conducting important research in many colleges and schools, engaging in important conversations and seeking critical investments that will position us to lead in the blue economy nationally and internationally. And I just, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many Rhode Island voters are here tonight? <laughs> okay, I'm speaking to you now. Uh, we have a general obligation bond. It's, uh, it's very important for the Narragansett Bay campus. Beautiful location, but we really want to see it be a uh, thriving, vibrant place for research on aquaculture, on oceanography, on ocean engineering, on environment, policy, really coming together. So it's, an, it's really uh, an important uh, bond for us, and so all Rhode Islanders, please vote yes on one and tell your friends and neighbors, so thank you. Conversations that happen at events like this tonight are what will continue to keep us on the leading edge of that mission. So I wanna thank you uh, for coming and thanks to all our special guests this evening. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dennis Nixon. He is Professor Emeritus of Marine Affairs and served as the director of the Rhode Island Sea Grant Program from 2013 to 2021, uh, leading the multi-million dollar research and education program that is devoted to using scientific knowledge to improve the management of Rhode Island's coastal waters, actually the international coastal waters too. Uh, it's not just Rhode Island, but prior to that, he served as the Associate Dean for Research and Administration at the Graduate School of Oceanography for four years and the previous eight years as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the College of Environment and Life Sciences at URI. Dennis was a URI faculty member for over 45 years, teaching and doing research in the area of marine and coastal law, and he is particularly proud of the thousands of former students now working in marine industries, government, law, science, academics. So please, Join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis Nixon.
Thank you. What, what a great evening. It's very exciting to be here at a, her presentation when uh, three men stood up and did the right thing for planet Earth, uh, representing different disciplines but they came up with uh, one of those rare to achieve uh, happy endings for an environmental problem that had been plaguing the Gulf of Mexico for some 14 years. And it's an incredible story, uh, part of which you've seen uh, possibly on 60 Minutes, we'll hear more about it tonight. But I'm really honored to be here in the front of the room with these three gentlemen who banded together among themselves known as the Three Amigos uh, to work despite their various, their widely varying disciplines to solve a problem that they recognized, and when they first got involved with it, we we're, were seriously put up against the wall uh, by, by the energy company that was still polluting the Gulf of Mexico. So um, not necessarily in order of appearance. They're going to arrange that themselves, but I'd like to introduce the three speakers we have uh, today. Uh, tonight, uh, we, we see first, I think, Timmy Covillian, the president and CEO of Bell Chase, Louisiana-based Covillian Group, which specializes in providing marine construction and salvage, port and vessel maintenance services, emergency response, and disaster recovery for the oil and gas and maritime industries, among others. In addition to his work containing the Taylor Energy oil spill, Timmy's team has worked with BP, the National Park Service, and local governments, including as a key first responder in the Plaquemines Parish of vessel recovery after Hurricane Katrina, returning hundreds of vessels to service via a unique lift and barge system that he designed. Timmy graduated from the University of New Orleans with a degree in mechanical engineering, and a fun fact I learned, he is indeed the two-time state West wrestling champion of Louisiana <laughs> when he was in high school, which, be careful with him later on. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Kennelly, the President and Chief Technologist for Kennelly & Associates, LLC, which is an oil and gas consulting company he established in 2018. Uh, most recently, uh, Kevin has been working with the Covillian Group to design, build, install, and operate a rapid response system, subsea, to successfully capture oil at Taylor Energy's Mississippi Canyon Block MC20 site for the past 14 plus years. Kevin has authored two books, published over 30 technical papers, and holds multiple patents. He received the D. Grant Mickle Award from the National Academies and the A.B. Campbell Award from the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, and is a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology based in the UK. His PhD in medical engineering, metallurgical engineering, is from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and finally, uh, Pat McShane. Uh, is the founding member of, of Freelo LLC, a full service legal firm offering representation in all areas of litigation on a local, regional, and national basis before all courts, administrative agencies, and tribunals. Uh, Freelo is recognized as one of the leading maritime law firms in the Gulf of Mexico. Their admiralty and maritime practice is led by Pat, who has extensive experience in representing a broad spectrum of maritime interests including domestic and foreign insurers, marine construction companies, ship owners and operators, major oil companies, as well as domestic and international P&I clubs and insurers. Uh, Pat graduated from Tulane Law School with his Juris Doctor in 1988, prior to that from the University of Rhode Island in 1985 with a Bachelor of Arts in Marine Affairs. And I, and I think the reason I was invited to be the MC tonight is I do remember him as a particularly bright student in, in my marine and coastal law class only 37 years ago. <laughs> With that, I'd like to turn it over to the three amigos, and you take it from here. Thank you. I was thrilled to sit uh, in Professor Nixon's class when I first came to URI, and one of the things I remember about him was he told uh, an account of making a visit to the Gulf of Mexico, and he described the situation down there where on the continental shelf, where the rigs and platforms are packed fairly closely together, that you could see oil rigs and platforms for as far as your eye could see. And, you know, this is the pre-internet days. You can't just listen to him and pop it up and look at the pictures. 
I think his uh, telling of the story made an impression on me before I went down to Tulane. And I now am in the Gulf of Mexico fishing tuna with my friends Kevin and Timmy about once a month. And I've made my living representing the interests of the oil patch, the vessel service companies, contractors such as Cuvion Group, and the rigs and platforms that operate in our shallow waters. So I had some experience in dealing with uh, situations like the uh, Taylor Energy spill. Um, but the funny thing about my involvement in this case is I wasn't really hired particularly because I had experience with rigs and platforms. I'd handled a couple of personal injury defense cases for Cuvion Group through their London insurers. I was, you might say I was foisted on Tim Cuvion, told by his insurers that I would be his lawyer. And after handling a couple of those kind of cases, I think I was able to persuade him that I provided some utility for him. And one day he said, hey, Pat, I've got to go over to the Coast Guard to have a meeting today about a project. I'm making a proposal on an oil spill matter. Would you like to go with me? And I said, sure. I had no idea that I'd been hired to get involved in this kind of mess. And when I went to the Coast Guard that day, I had no idea that I was going to be the subject of a full frontal assault by six or seven lawyers from the biggest law firm in New Orleans who decided that the way to handle the bright-eyed proposals coming from Tim Cuvion and his excellent team was to attack him personally, through litigation, through uh, political influence. And so this is the story that really began that day when we went to the Coast Guard to listen to Tim Cuvion make his proposal uh, to the government and also to Taylor Energy. Before we get into the uh, meat and potatoes about this story, there is one sort of overarching question. In fact, Professor Nixon mentioned it as he walked in today, which is, how does this story stay off the front page? From calendar year 2004, this, that's, the, uh, that's the year when this accident happened. What happened was we had a Category 5 hurricane uh, stretch across the Gulf of Mexico. It was very impactful on the Florida Panhandle, causing a lot of physical damage there. But at the mouth of the Mississippi River, the Mississippi Canyon uh, block, Taylor Energy's eight-leg platform was confronted with 70-foot waves. And it was knocked over sideways. It toppled, as spun out of control as it laid to rest on the seafloor. It had 28 oil wells leading to the platform. And as the, as the platform toppled and rolled down and, and, partially, and was partially covered by a mudslide, all of those wells uh, broke, the connections broke, pipes were buried under a mudslide, and uh, the end result was that we began to have an oil leak that summer of 2004 that, uh, as sickening as it may sound to you, continues to leak at a very significant rate even today. So we have an 18-year event at the Mississippi Canyon 20 site discharge of oil from high pressure plumes of the sea, coming out of the seafloor 500 feet below the surface. And so the question here is, why wouldn't this have been front page news? And if you hadn't heard about this spill before today, or if you happen to catch the 60 Minutes episode, why are you learning about this 18 years after the accident? Our story, our role here, has to do with uh, an invitation by the federal government to propose a containment solution and the related association of the Cuvion Group to, in, to design and install that containment solution. So it's important to recognize what we have going on here is we have ongoing spill from some number of the 28 well, wells that are, continue to be buried in mud. No one can say for, for certain which of the 28 lines are continuing to leak oil. And a permanent solution for uh, stopping the flow of oil from these leaky wells is still in the future. The science is really not caught up with the difficulty presented by a toppled oil platform that had 28 wells that then get buried by a mudslide. So we're not talking here today about a plug and abandonment situation. 
which is the phrase that we use broadly for capping and pumping cement down wells to shut them down once, once their utility, their uh, useful life has passed. What we're talking about is ongoing jets or plumes, pressure plumes of oil coming out of the seafloor and spilling straight into the pristine waters of the Gulf of Mexico. So there is a distinction there. Our focus was um, in supporting Tim's presentation of a proposal to the federal government about how to contain the oil that's coming out. If we don't know how to fix the main problem right now and stop the plumes, is there a way to capture this oil as the oil spills into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico? That's the saga of the Taylor Energy oil spill that once we finished uh, installing our, our containment system and we finished the first chapter in the trial court of um, a very aggressive litigation between Cuvion and, um, and um, Taylor Energy, 60 Minutes picked up this story and for the first time last November played, uh, played the segment about Tim's involvement here. So we're going to get to the answer to that rhetorical question. We started out with the same question. Why is this something that's not on the front page? Let's just focus for a minute on how Taylor responded to this bill when it first happened. Under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, the party who owns and operates a facility like this that has a spill or an event like this is designated as the responsible party under the open ID. So it's not a question of negligence or fault. If it's your facility and you got oil leaking, you're in charge of coming up with an abatement plan and in the meantime, managing and handling the contingent. When you're a responsible party under OPA, it's not by your choice, it's the government's choice that you will be working shoulder to shoulder with the government. The government will put, designate a single person to be in charge, which is called the Federal On-Scene Coordinator. And that coordinator will approve the plans for solving the problems moving forward. In this case, Taylor Energy approached this undertaking in earnest and spent hundreds of millions of dollars studying and implementing containment and abatement strategies. They, uh, at one stage, made an effort to cap nine of the wells that they, their best assessment was, those were the nine that were leaking, and they spent $225 million on those nine wells alone without ever reaching any satisfactory conclusion about whether the, uh, the, the work that had been done on those nine wells made any difference at all. But the effort seemed uh, to be in earnest. It was seemed to be a good faith effort. Um, Along the way, a couple of things happened. Uh, Patrick Taylor was the founder of this privately owned oil company, and he passed away. After that, the company decided that it wanted to wind down its business and sell its assets. Well, if you're a responsible party under the Oil Pollution Act, you can't just cut and run. And so a deal was negotiated that required Taylor Energy to deposit, and I'm not making this number up, it's almost too good to be true, $666 million in a federal escrow account controlled by the Department of the Interior. That money is to be used for ultimate plug and abandonment once some bright-eyed engineers come up with a good idea for how to stop this oil from leaking into the Gulf. The interest earned on that money each year is um, Taylor is allowed to have that money returned to them. So what we're left with is what I would call a skeleton corporation that consists of a small team whose job it is to work with lawyers and experts, at least on the face of it, to continue with the OPA 90 undertaking to try to solve the problem at hand. But once that money was put into an account and was sitting there, it became almost an irresistible urge to see whether a strategy could be developed to get the money back. And that's where uh, we came into this, and that's where uh, some of the aggressive attitude toward Cuvion uh, comes into play, which I'm going to explain to you now. All right, why the silence? This is the next segment.
from uh, 60 Minutes, and I'll come back to the money part. So against pressure from a large oil company, against pressure uh, from someone who has strong connections with uh, politicians and big business, that person uh, is a great hero, uh, the FOSC Captain Luttrell. And as you'll see, that she, she ended up, because of her bravery and her willing to take on Taylor Energy, she paid a price for it, too, that we'll talk about in a little bit. So Taylor is shifting their focus away from trying to solve this problem in earnest. Um, and one reason might be that there's that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. What would it take to get the $666 million returned to Taylor? Let me drop a footnote and say that because of the work done on the nine wells at about $250 million, the money in that account was burned down to $432 million. What would it take for Taylor to get that money put back in their pockets? And what sort of things might they be willing to do to achieve that aim? Well, the shift in focus kind of paints a picture that helps us get to an answer. First, as a litigator, I can tell you that what we do with experts in court cases is each side hires their own expert, and within the range of reasonableness, we all try to put our own spin on a certain set of facts. You can have a man who's hurt on the job, and my economist will say his wage loss was 100 grand, and his economist will say his wage loss was 250. Shouldn't be that hard, but that's kind of the nature of litigation. The experts involved in matters such as this is probably when you're assessing their credibility and whether you put stock in what they have to say, it's useful to ask what are their motives and who's paying for we went over a fairly extended period with Taylor Energy hosting seminars, hiring experts, publishing reports, taking the expert reports, stuffing them in three ring binders and waving them around to say all of the best experts say one thing or another. Um, and so in this case, the points that the experts were relied on to prove were two. The first one was that the amount of oil that was spilling out of the site was minimal. Sometimes the comparisons were drawn to the natural seepage that we have in the Gulf of Mexico, and we do have natural seepage. Why should we try to solve this problem when it's no more oil than the natural seepage that happens down at the other end of the water? Second fact that Taylor put a lot of energy into trying to prove against the backdrop of other problems in the Gulf of Mexico, this was a lever that Taylor Energy could crank that really would cause concern with people, and it was, hey, if you disturb this site by trying to fix the problem, there's a great risk that you will worsen the discharge, that you will cause a calamity. So when you're trying to get the Coast Guard to do nothing and to lay off you, if you can sell this two-prong point, that is, number one, it's, no, it's really not a problem. There's barely any oil at all. And couple that with number two, look, you cannot disturb this site because the risks are catastrophic. If you can sell that, then the next point slots in quite cleanly, which is, look, since the best answer is to do nothing, let me have my money back. And so here we have a situation where before the money was put into a fund, Taylor's spending their own money, and they're approaching this in earnest. And now this money's sitting there. And it's a, it, it is a gamut. Let's see what we can do. We'll see if we can't make our best effort to get that money back. That actually culminated in lawsuits that included arguing about the terms and conditions of the trust agreement that Taylor signed in the first place, where they had agreed to keep the money there for 30 years. They dissolved their company came right back with a lawsuit saying that the text of the document didn't really mean what it said it meant. And they litigated that part of the case in Washington, D.C. and lost. So you're dealing with a very influential company, a benevolent corporate citizen. They've got more influence than just about anybody in the state of Louisiana. They're extremely wealthy. The, um, Mr. Taylor's widow is on, is on the Forbes list. 
And if you're the federal on-scene coordinator, you're the government, you're a little bit um, intimidated, perhaps, by this. But I can tell you that in, in addition to Christy Luttrell, the federal on-scene coordinator, the second hero in this case was an EPA executive who did a flyover to look at the sheen one day and came back and when she reached land, she picked up her cell phone and she called her supervisors in, ex in an extremely colorful verbiage, explained to her supervisors that she was absolutely certain that Taylor was not being honest about the amount of oil. And how could you conclude otherwise? Because we know the size of the oil sheen, which has been more or less constant at this location since 2004, is sometimes 30 miles by three miles. And you have Taylor Energy through their experts saying it's a three gallon a day spill. So the flyover was done, the proof is in the pudding. The government then decides, look, we gotta stop relying on these litigation type, bought and paid for, hire guns, stick a quarter in their ear, experts. What we need is an independent assessment of what's going on out there. And a new expert was retained by the government to calculate the amount of oil that was discharging. His report issued in 2018, and in October of 2018, his study and the findings were picked up on a very thoroughly written story in the Washington Post. Within a month, the Coast Guard decided that they needed to shift gears too, and no longer take it on faith what representations were being made by Taylor Energy. They now know that they have a bigger spill problem they weigh the pluses and minuses, and they conclude that it's not a good idea to just leave this site alone. So they begin the search for a containment um, contractor, and that's when I turned up at the Coast Guard with Timmy Cuvion, thinking it was just a pleasant visit. Tim made his proposal. The government selected Tim. The government directed Taylor Energy to enter into a contract with Timmy. And instead of doing that, they really went on the offensive. I'd never seen anything like it. Mr. Cuvion, we've been working on this site since 2004. We know every containment expert on the planet. We know the smartest subsea engineers in the, on the globe. We've never heard of you. And because we've never heard of you, we conclude that there's no way that you and your team have the proficiency, the skill sets, the credibility, and we object to you being selected for this job. The government's issued an order in response to all that nonsense in, in a meeting room. And the order said, you have 72 hours to enter into a contract with Mr. Cuvion. Failing which, we're taking over the job. And what that means is the job would be federalized, that the role of Taylor Energy as being effectively in charge of this job would be taken from Taylor, who would remain the responsible party under Open 90, who would have to pay the bills, but who would lose control over the decision making and the strategic approach to what was going on at the job site. So um, I didn't know I was going to be writing a contract that night. <laughs> I walked back to the office. My partner Danica and I wrote a contract through the night. Master service agreements for vendors and services in the um, in the oil patch in Louisiana. They're very detailed contracts, and the customer usually sets up a lot of different terms that have to do with risk allocation. So the contract will say, look, Cuvion, if you go out there and start this work and you make it worse, you're responsible, I'm not. Or everybody has to agree to sign a hold harmless that says Taylor Energy will not be sued, only Cuvion will. If they had the leverage, that's the kind of contract that they would have drafted and presented to us. But we wrote the contract, and we were in the room where the government said, if Taylor doesn't want to sign it, you're going to get the job anyway. And so our contract that we wrote through the night had no risk allocation landing on Cuvion Group. And the, the best part of it was we required that uh, Taylor Energy set up a second escrow account and that Cuvion would be paid each day they prepared a job ticket, a daily progress report. It was initialed by the United States Coast Guard. In other words, the party who's obligated to pay us has no role in whether we get paid. They looked at it and they said, we can't sign this contract. And we said, okay, 
And so, the, you know, really that was a positive outcome because we ended up working at the direction of the federal government who had a shared goal of actually achieving oil containment at the site rather than some cat's paw effort to pretend like you're trying to solve a problem, but you're really just trying to get your money back. So when the federal government uh, took over and um, the containment job, uh, the next thing is to really explore what it is that Cuvion was asked to do. And so Timmy's going to take a turn and do that for you. Uh, so before I get started, um, I wanted to take the, uh, a moment to to thank my wife. Uh, today's our, <laughs> today's our uh, 21st anniversary, and she was kind enough <laughs> to lend me to you guys, and, uh, and, and this is a common theme for us. So she, uh, she goes through much sacrifice, and she lets me endeavor in the challenges that I've always tackled. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this little one-pager, this is what the Coast Guard gave us to, 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 you know, to fix this problem. A um, couple points here. One half of it was wrong, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of that later, right? So um, be careful what people tell you and, and, and validate what, uh, what they tell you. Uh, they were correct in the 470 foot. The temperature was wrong, which, which is going to drive something towards uh, hydrates or no hydrates. And, and that's uh, hydrates are... The problem in the BP spill, when they put a dome over that, the differential pressure and the hydrates formed and it turned into a big block of ice. In our case, uh, we were more at 65 degrees, uh, warm uh, gulf waters and uh, no hydrate issue. Uh, the seafloor was uh, uh, sediments, they were unconsolidated. Look, a diver dropped a 30 pound bolt, right, and just reached over, picked it up. So it was actually right there in the erosion pit. It was, uh, it was hard because a lot of the unconsolidated sand had been lifted in, into the and moved, and, and there's an erosion pit there that's the size of, size of a, a tennis court. Um, another real key, and I'm going to show this to you when we do the fabrication, you're going to see this little, this little uh, uh, extension onto our dome, and that's because in, in these response, these uh, emergency response time is of the essence, okay? So we started engineering and fabricating um, this, this dome before we even went on site based off of their numbers. And instead of a 40 by 30 area, it should have been a 50 by 20. Um, but we, we shifted gears, and, and, and I'll show you that, that correction uh, on, on the go. The next uh, bullet, as far as being uh, seven foot from the jacket, that was pretty accurate. 60 foot of mud, they don't know. We now know uh, more information about what it looks like under the seafloor. Um, currents, uh, so it said that there were, um, the currents on the seafloor were, were negligible. Well, I'll tell you, we actually measured some currents at about 1.6 knots. And just to give you a reference, a normal diver, if there's two, two knots of current, that's like pushing 140 pounds against a person. So we were, um, at times, the divers would literally have to hold on to the ROVs or the underwater robots to help us transit the site and get from location to location, not to mention they were um, covered in oil daily as well. Um, the, the visibility is uh, variable. Uh, some days it's, it's crystal blue water and beautiful, and, and other days we rely solely on, on sonar. And uh, it needed to be capable of uh, uh, 250 barrels. Uh, we're actually collecting, we started collecting about 25 barrels a day, and, and we wound up, we're at about 17 on average over the past couple of years. So again, um, this was it, and then we had to develop the, the entire playbook from scratch. I want to, to start <clears throat> by, some of you may not be familiar with uh, oil field uh, things. So you're going to hear me say jacket a, a couple times. So uh, the, the image on the left, this is the entire platform. The, the jacket structure is the lattice work and, and the structure that keeps the, um, the platform vertical. Uh, th this is the platform or the top structure which was essentially removed uh, before we got there. Uh, so, so um, and if you look here, these red dots here are going to represent. Uh, so this is the, the, the platform that had fallen to its side. 
and these two red dots are uh, the erosion pit where the, the oil's coming out. And we're going to go back to the 60 minutes. So, you know, 60 minutes piece really gives us a lot of street credit, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know about y'all, but I don't, I don't know anybody ever been on 60 minutes before. You know, I, I watched this thing for the first time. I was like, man, I, I know those guys, right? You know, I was, I was so proud. And we had a, we had a big party. It was, it was great. But, but anyway. <laughs> So if, if the engineering and such for this job wasn't difficult enough, you know, I've been all, I've asked what was some of the toughest things and, you know, couple that with uh, the politics, the litigation, um, the misinformation and such, and, and yeah, uh, th this job uh, was, was, was very challenging. It stretched my bandwidth uh, greater than, than anything that, that I've taken, undertaken uh, in my career. Um, and, and so, but, but with that comes great reward and great pride. Um, the, the personal um, bonds that I've made with Dr. Canelli, um, Pat McShane, Jack Couch, and, and the other, you know, uh, we'd have some 500 people working on this thing at any given time. And uh, to see everyone's personal sacrifice to, to, to really band together was, was really impressive. Uh, it was a, a, a wonderful, um, you know, you had, the, you had the villain that was kind of slinging stuff at us, and then, and, you know, we came in as as the heroes, and, uh, and, and it felt really good. So uh, this is the first day that we're on site. And remember, it's lauded that it's only three gallons a day. And, and just look at the, that vessel there is, um, that vessel is about 250 foot, right? So it's almost as big as a football field. And, and then that's just the oil that you see uh, in that picture. And again, some of these streaks, some of the stuff would, would stretch 30 miles. So this is the first day on site. And uh, this is a, another rendition of the, the, what we were faced with, right? So we got oil plumes that are coming up uh, seven foot from the jacket and uh, towards the, the bottom end of the jacket. If you hear me say, re reference uh, a 340 uh, elevation or three, the, the, the 340 uh, horizontal, um, the jacket, we, each level is uh, based off of an elevation. So all the way to the left is going to be 440. Uh, 330. So I want to give you a reference of the plume. You know, that's that's uh, 50 foot wide, and it's uh, the jacket's about 50 foot off of the um, off of the seat floor. So, and this is all in in you know 470 foot of water. So it's uh, you know, it's pretty deep, and um, and and these things that we're doing are, are really large scale. You know, those you can see by the picture of the uh, the guys with the um, you know, next to the equipment. These clamps that we put on there are the size of Volkswagen bugs. Um, the one that we put to, to, to latch on to the leg. If I, if I stood up on the inside of the jack of the, of the, the clamp, I got to put my hand up and I could barely touch the inside of the jacket. The bolts that we put in place to be able to, to put them together, they weigh about 300 pounds a piece. And, and as hard as you would think that's, that is in water, it's really not that difficult. You just tie a bucket onto it and fill it with air and you can move it around with one hand. You know? <laughs> so, um, but we, we, you know, we try to make it sound like it's tougher than what it is. Um, Okay, so um, I wanted to, so, so there was the problem, and then this is the solution. And um, again, I'm going to try to say what the video said, but just say it a little bit slower. And listen, if anybody has any questions, right, or they, they want me to expand a little bit on, on something more, uh, please do, because I know this stuff. I've, I've lived and dreamed it for, uh, for, for several years now. Um, and so it makes sense to me. It's simple, right? It only took, you know, 18 years to come up with it. Okay, this, uh, this box here is the, uh, is the dome. Now, I've been challenged that uh, uh, the definition of a dome is spherical in shape, and, and I've lost that uh, argument, but we're going to, we'll just call it a collection device, right? Um, we, we, we started with a dome, but we, we figured for, for speed that we didn't need a, a spherical dome. We can make it faster with uh, the I-36 beams and uh, actually uh, W-30 uh, uh, beams. And then the, you see the, the, the extension is where, um, where we got bad information, we started building, we had to add that on, on to there. Uh, so so the, remember, the jacket fell over, and there's 28 wells or 28 conductors or a conductor bundle, and it's buried in, in the mud. So all we see is just oil that's bubbling up from the sea floor. Um, now with the, the oil comes gas, sediment, and water as well. So those are the things we have to deal with. And, and 
they told us to be careful with hydrates, and really hydrates weren't the problem for us, it was sediment. Uh, sediment was, was one of the biggest challenges. Well, why is this system sort of unique, and what's the heart of, of this system? And it's going to be the, the separator itself. So the separator is that vertical pipe, and in the top part of that vertical pipe, what we did was we created a little snorkel that came down, and um, it created an air pocket in the top part of the separator. So uh, to separate water and oil from gas, you need gravity, and usually uh, the buoyancy forces in water would be greater than what gravity is. There's gravity down the sea floor. I've dropped enough tools to fill up a <laughs> back of a pickup truck, and, and, and I can't, and, and, our, and that's only the stuff that I know about. Um, so uh, oil is going to float. Gas is going to go up, but we needed to get the gas out of the, uh, out of the oil. The gas, we just vent off, right? And by the time it reaches the surface, it dissipates so much that we've had meters on our vessels for three years now. We've never gotten any reading of any, any LEL meters or readings uh, whatsoever. So by the, 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 there's some good, you know, the, there's a real dynamic environment at the mouth of the, mouth of the Mississippi. It's lots of current and stuff, and it gets, uh, the gas gets vented off. The oil is the problem that creates the sheen, and that's what we capture or that's what we put into the tanks. So oil, gas, and water goes into the containment system. Um, it all gets routed into the separator. Water drops out the bottom, gas gets vented off, and the oil then flows up into these tanks. Um, I'll show you, okay. Um, so this slide here, if you notice, this tank here is bigger than these four. Um, that just, I had those four pipes in my yard, right? <laughs> and, and, and it was faster, it was, it was faster. So uh, we fabricated this big one, right? Uh, but we had these already done, and, and again, everything is, um, you know, it's, it's speed, right? We, 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 you, you say that, it's kind of, you know, 14 years of them doing nothing, and now I'm under pressure to have to produce this. Just to give you an idea, a, a, a project this size should take about three years, okay? There's, there's, there's you know, design engineering, you, 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 you review it, you peer review, you go, you go, you go, and, um, and, and you should be, it should, we did this in five months, right? That's, that's unheard of. And we were really, what was really great about this is that we installed 250 tons of steel overboard on a beat up jacket that we had to make straight, and we did all of that one time. We installed all of the, the hardware uh, overboard at one time, it all fit. And that was because our, Q, uh, our quality assurance and quality uh, controls were so tight. And, and understand this, we had five different engineering firms working on different components. We had five different fabricators fabricating in six different locations and all different components. And we had to put all this together um, and make it work. We took a barge. Went through Louisiana, picked up all the components, came back to Fouchon, actually Fouchon and Venice, and we, we put these together. Um, and so we did fit tests where it was reasonable. We did just the hoses. You had to bring the hose fabric. You know, if something doesn't fit, it's a big problem offshore. So we went through lots of uh, efforts to get that uh, uh, to work out. And like I said, testing, we even started, my wife had to deal with us testing this in our backyard pool, and, and then we went to... So um, this is an echo scope of, you'd seen the before, and then this is the after, right? So uh, before and after. Um, this system, although it looks like there's a bunch of hoses and a bunch of things, essentially think of it as, as this. It's one gigantic upside down cup, right? And so um, the, the water drops from the tanks, everything is at the same elevation. And the idea is, for every drop that goes into it, a drop of water gets to place and gets pushed out the bottom. So this whole system is full of water right now until a drop of oil comes in it and then it's partially filled with oil. We go by once a month with the motor vessel Brandon Bordelon. We plug into the system. We pump off about 20,000 gallons uh, a month and we bring it into shore and we recycle it. So we use this is uh, productive. Heat your homes, drive your vehicles um, here. So the ROV goes down, latches into the system, pumps it up to some tanks on the vessel. We bring it in to 
to shore. And uh, we just reached a major milestone. So um, we just caught a million gallons of oil that would have otherwise been released into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's, uh, that's something that's, that we're real proud of. So to date, So it's uh, as of April 12th, uh, when, we, when we first installed the system to, uh, uh, it's actually, that one's uh, last month, September, we're at 1,086,594.6, only engineer picks up that joke. <laughs> and this is how we left the site on the, uh, the day when we left. And um, although we get, a, we get a, a, an occasional sheen from time to time, and we're working to figure out what that is. Um, we are, um, it's 450 foot of water, we're not there every day. And so it's difficult to, to really understand all the nuances that are happening there. But we've made many different adjustments, corrections, and, and such that, um, yeah, we've collected a million gallons. Any questions on the engineering side of it? Here in front. Okay, so, so we're, we actually, we're saving Dr. Canelli for, for tomorrow's uh, uh, detailed talk. Pat does have another five, uh, what you got, an, another couple quick. minutes. To come back full circle to all this engineering work is going on, but solar energy is going in a parallel path because they're really making fun of the uh, cloud suit against Canelli. And the suit was filed before any of this work and it's now going into this lawsuit. You're trespassing on my jacket, okay? The jacket had been abandoned since it toppled over in 2004. The Taylor Energy lease was up in 2006. The federal government owns the property. The property is effectively abandoned there, and the suit was, you're causing me damage because you're trespassing on my jacket. There was a declaratory judgment aspect where they wanted a ruling that if there was any exacerbation of the problem, that was Timmy's fault, not theirs. There was arguments in suits against Timmy and both the government that the government wasn't authorized to hire Tim. So I guess the one message about these lawsuits from Timmy's standpoint is he had to make a decision. Do you have the gumption, the will, the tenacity to go do this job and, and fight your parallel fight with the lawsuit? And that's where I came in. I think I probably tipped the scales, and he decided let's go ahead and take him on in the lawsuit. And... Um, so this is the finishing uh, part of the 60 minutes. We've got just a couple minutes here, and then we'll be done. So what would you do for $432 million? Would you publish reports that say there were three gallons a day coming out of this facility? Would you sue Tim Kuvion before he ever started the work? Would you continue the suit against him after he started to successfully gather the oil? Would you... Say, oh, if it's a 1,000 gallons a day, Timmy, you must have exacerbated the problem out there. That wasn't us because it was all this work. They did Would that. Say, <laughs> Would you file lawsuits against a hero like the federal on-scene coordinator in this case? This is the kind of uh, heavy-handedness that we were up against. We won the case on a governmental immunity, establishing that all of Tim's work was at the direction of the, of, of the federal government so that he could not be sued. But... We were not able to get that ruling until Taylor got to do about a half million dollars worth of discovery in the case. So they really wanted to put the boot on his neck. I'm convinced they didn't care about winning or losing the case. It was the process and the effort to try to scare Timmy off from doing the job at all. So those are the things that we had to navigate through to get to where we are today. We still have to plug in a band-aid. Somebody's got to figure out how to make this thing stop. And thankfully, the Taylor Energy saga the money part is over because they've given up any efforts to get the money back. We like to think it's because this show aired. And if you're on the Forbes list and you're 80 years old, call me crazy. But maybe one idea would be, I don't want this for the last chapter of my life. You guys figure out how to fix it. And so they did. They walked away from their effort to get the 432, I think, because of Tim's comments at the end of this show. And then they paid a penalty of about 30 or $40 million. That's a $3,000 a barrel penalty that you can have to pay under Open 90. And if you think of the barrels that we've recovered and extrapolate over the number of years that this spill was not being contained, you're looking at 
penalties that could have been, I think we did, we concluded it could have been in the billion. Seven, yeah, 700 million. 700 million dollars. We paid about 30 or 40. But it got resolved and Taylor Energy is off everybody's back. And the gover but government is now bringing best efforts to deal with this situation. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. It was really an amazing story. Uh, we've got a couple of folks with uh, gonna, our, our microphone bearers. Uh, we have time for questions here now. We left about uh, 20 minutes for questions for anybody. Um, I'm going to lead off by asking uh, Timmy, uh, with all that money going back to the federal government, I assume you've got continuing expenses as you go out to pick up that oil and bring it back into shore. Who's going to pay your bills from now on? The Coast Guard is the responsible party, and uh, they're responsible for the cleanup. So um, the after the Exxon Valdez case, the government set up the oil spill liability trust fund. And so there's a fraction of each barrel of oil. Uh, some money is put into a fund. I think right now it's at like 3. Point some, you know, 3.4 billion or so. And so when there is imminent threat to public safety, such as this, mm -hmm. the, uh, the federal on-scene coordinator, and it was uh, uh, Christy Luttrell in this case, has the authority to federally assume it and then pull money from the oil spill liability trust fund. So all of my bills are paid uh, for, paid for through the oil spill liability trust fund, and we'll continue to do so. Well, that's very good. You know, under the Clean Water Act, uh, a violation of that law is to create a visible sheen on the water, which you can do with an eyedropper of oil. That's a violation of federal law. And the fact that, I, once again, a million gallons of oil pulled out. Let's hear from a million gallons. <laughs> All right. Uh, someone had a question here just to get started. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Question. So that was a big concern from the divers. They didn't want the divers to, to be in a big mousetrap. Um, if you fill it with gas, um, oh, well, so w we actually put buoyancy containers inside the, uh, the, the dome. There's a, if you look from the fabrication pieces, you see some ribs and then there's a flat spot. So we flooded it, filled it with air so that it wouldn't be too heavy actually on the, on the jacket when we did the finite element analysis. So it's the weight of the structure that keeps it from coming up. Um, it's, it's bolted to the strong back um, down below, about seven foot off the seafloor, and then up top we have some clamps with chains to hold it um, above the, above the seafloor. We elevated above the seafloor to minimize uh, the sediment that went into the system, and so it wouldn't, if you set it on the floor, it'll sink out of sight. So it's the weight of the dome that keeps it from coming up. If it was all full of gas, it could come up. Big problem. It, it, that, that's why we have to vent the gas off, is because um, it, just like the, the oil tanks themselves, if they filled with gas and, and got loose, they'd shoot like a torpedo to the surface. Other questions? Uh, yes, in the second row. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that sediment was a problem. Is the sediment mostly suspended in the water? And when you vent off the water, vent is the wrong word, but you know what I mean, flush out the water, the sediment goes, or is there some other thing that you do? When we look at the, when we look at the, the topography or the maps, um, there, there was no erosion pit in 2008. Um, so there was, and now there's an erosion pit under our system the size of a tennis court. Um, we do, the echoscope image gives us the contours of the bottom, and that erosion pit is growing. I think it was, uh, what, like, it was 25 dump trucks, 25 18-yard dump trucks a year that, that's running, that's being removed and running through our system. So um, when we airlift, let's say we want to expose a pipeline or expose something that's buried. We, uh, we take a, a pipe and then we push air into it at the bottom and as it expands, it, it creates a, an air vac, a vacuum. So the system essentially, there's gas that's in the sea floor and as it uh, runs through the soil, it grabs just a little tiny um, speck of sand or, or sediment with it and carries it in, in uh, up and out the way or into our system. So that's the issue. We have to, we've created a robust 
flushing system. And remember, the drive pressure in our system is like one PSI because we have no moving parts. It just has to flow naturally. So it's the, it's the buoyancy or the differential uh, density in oil and water that drives it. Uh, so at one PSI, it's not going to move very much sediment. So every month, we have to, to perform a robust flushing of the entire system, every hose and such. We, we replace the hoses every year so that they don't get clogged, et cetera. And if it wasn't sediment, it's an ivory soap bottle or duct tape or anything you can imagine we've, we've sucked up into, into our system, we've had to deal with it. So um, marine debris in general sediment is the problem. But we've, we've, we can manage it, it's just, it's tough sometimes. Question, and this, this man right here. Um, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, is there any way to stop this oil from coming up? I mean, can you pour concrete down it or whatever BP has done to stop these things? Yes. There's a, I'll help you out on this. Go ahead. Man. <laughs> the, uh, on the sediment, it goes from a couple hundred microns in particulate size down to one micron. So it doesn't all fall out in the, in the time in the separator is insufficient. So that's why sediment's a problem. And Timmy said we flush it out. On your question, there is existing technology today to permanently plug and abandon those wells. Very similar to what they did on Deepwater Horizon with Macondo, where they drill, drill relief wells. There's 28 of these wells out there. They go in every different direction and they look like a, a spider's nest as they go down. They can extend out for a mile or two. So in order to drill one of those wells, they're, they're on the order of 60 to $70 million a piece. So it's a very expensive uh, proposition to do, but it's, it's doable. And right now, that's one way to do it. The second way to do it is to try to find those pipes where they're buried under up to 200 feet of mud and get access to them and do it what they call top kill. And that's getting looked at now. Isn't there also the possibility of just continuing to the third maintain right. the system until the reservoir effectively loses its pressure? Now, that may take years, right. but 17 million times 10 years instead of... Yeah, the third, the third option is to just keep using this system. It's doing a pretty good job of collecting the oil out there until the wells just deplete. And the depletion rate is about 7% a year. But as it drops down, there's still quite a bit of oil coming out of those things, and it, it would last a long time. That's, that's the third option. Remember with, with plug and abandonment, it's done. There's, there's um, hundreds and thousands of wells that are abandoned every year, but you have access to them. So the, the problem with this project is that you don't have access to them. So even with the Macondo well, even though they drilled two relief wells, they still had a hold of it up top where they can test pressures and run diagnostics and things of that nature. So the real uh, challenge of this one is that the conductors are buried, um, uh, buried potentially deeper than what we can dig a hole. Yes, President Parrish. Could, could it uh, be that, you know, you have 200 uh, feet of mud, you said, above the source. Could that source move? Could it move through the porous media so that it is actually not coming up to the to the dome and then you have another problem? You know, you need a bigger dome or you need a second? We, we built the dome so that, well, we built the porch to so the 16 inch tubular structure that's below the, the dome itself. We made it so we can move it around in case that was the case. You know, uh, Taylor Energy claimed that it was like whack-a-mole, that, you know, you can never contain it because it comes up here and it comes up there. In um, three and a half years, it had moved. So we think it's um, four distinct, uh, the end of four dis distinct conductors there's, um, they're coming up out of the same location. Could it move? Yes. Could we have another mudslide? Yes. Um, you know, and, and we've been, that's been a concern, but so far it had moved. Any questions? Yes, sir. So I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, is related to what was just asked. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes there is a sheen uh, on the surface. And I was, you mentioned uh, uh, before the uh, amount of current that's down at the bottom there. And I was wondering if that might be uh, a factor in 
moving the, the plumes around uh, as well as anything else, and then you end up losing stuff from around the edges of the dome. So absolutely. Um, there was a real, you know, there was a discussion on how it, you, 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 know, you give and take when you fi try to fix one problem, you, you create another one. So mm -hmm. the higher that we put the dome, the less problem we would have with sediment, but yet the higher we put it, uh, so we created um, curtains, and we did it like in a bell-type fashion so that we increased our capture radius. Um, and uh, does it, do we get a wicked current from time to time? Canelli and Dylan studied millions and millions of data points and tried, tried to correlate current uh, magnitude and direction with, with some of the, the satellite visual, and we, we weren't really able to come up with a consistent um, reasoning uh, for it. So. Uh, yes, it could blow out, and, and there's, a, there's a give and take on what problem you're trying to fix. Mm. Did you also lower the dome or lower it? We did lower the dome. We started off at seven foot, and we actually corrected the dome on our first annual campaign. We brought it a little bit lower to the, uh, to the seafloor. Okay. And it's, it's, he did the analysis. Uh, we did an um, analysis on, on, on percent caught, like a percent efficiency, and we're capturing some 97, 98% of the oil. So based off of machines prior to, which were averaging uh, four, over 40 kilometers per day, 40 square kilometers per day, we get a sheen every couple months. We get a small quarter, point, point, point 0.2 kilometer sheen that's, you know, barely visible. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, that there are 28 wells that were attached to this platform. And do all of those 28 wells basically come to uh, a common point that was the, the source of those two plumes? Or are there places elsewhere where the whack-a-mole reference that you made before? Um, we believe that the conductor bundle is intact and that they all come to the same point. Um, there, there are some indications that they might have some vertical anomalies, uh, meaning some gas, vertical gas uh, that was picked up in some of the sonars. There's three different locations for that where some of the conductors might have been cracked or you know, there was a leak in some of the other conductors, and, and that could be a source of the mystery machines, but for the most part, uh, we think it terminates uh, at the same location. Yes, sir. It, it all sounds like terrific engineering. I've got to congratulate you all, but I, I was wondering, can you determine from the 28 wells from which the oil is still flowing out into the ocean? And if so, could you isolate those wells in some way either by capping them or I think you mentioned a relief uh, well to do it, to, get to, to fix it at the source rather than the way it, it's been fixed? Taylor Energy claimed that all the information went down with the rig. Uh. <laughs> Lucky for us that we were able to identify uh, certain samples. So BP had done some of the exploration early on and they had had some of the um, some of the fingerprints uh, on, on record, and we were able to, to match those with some of the reservoirs. Now, the, the problem is we're collecting multiple domes, multiple uh, plumes at one time, so we can't really get a segregated um, uh, fingerprint. But, um, you know, so, so could we if, we, if we can get to the end of the pipes, uh, would we be able to source it to a particular uh, reservoir? Uh, yes, uh, that would be, but Again, it, we, we'd have to dig a hole deeper than uh, any holes ever been dug in, in the Gulf of Mexico or, or the world for that matter. So we don't know if we can positively identify the particular reservoir, but we can narrow it down. Well, I, I, I appreciate your explanation and I get that, but from the wellhead itself, you know, from the well, does, is there some way of measuring whether or not oil is still flowing out from the well? So the the, the wellheads are, com wells are they're completely buried. Right, the wellheads are ripped off the cellar deck and stripped out of the, the platform, and so we think that it's separated. The wellheads themselves were, were actually still attached to the platform, to the cellar deck, and so they're, they're no longer on the end of the pipes. Now, there are still sub-safety uh, you know, sub valves that are inside the conductors themselves. Some of them obviously failed, but um, so no, there, there's no way for us to positively uh, uh, isolate one particular zone and know to go after that zone. Uh, yes, sir, in back. Just a quick question, a quick financial question. I assume the operation and maintenance costs you're incurring now are paid out of the $400 million, is that correct? 
it's not correct. The four hundred million dollars is is prescribed, or the six hundred sixty six was specifically prescribed per well. So it was like twenty five point five million per well. And, and the problem that that Taylor Energy was having was that they were spending fifty or sixty million on a well, but they can only be they can only reimburse themselves twenty five point five. So they figured out real soon that after they drilled the first nine that this was they were going to run out of money and that this was going to cost you know uh, real expensive. So our, our maintenance cost runs about seventeen million a year. And, and it is paid for out of the oil spill liability trust fund. Not out of the $400 million because that's for plug and abandonment only and not for the trust fund. Right. Yeah, that trust fund comes off of our gallon gas equipment supplier trust fund. Okay, so Mr. Anderson. So, um, oh, sorry, that was very loud. <laughs> um, your firm, do you have any plans to look further into some sort of safety system that would prevent, you know, when it toppled over, like some sort of stops, like that could cap it if this type of thing happens again, considering? Well, our system itself, we've actually, um, we've modified, we, we did a new generation separator where we, um, we, we improved it. And then we took the old separator, made those improvements, and then we built it into a, a, a modular a portable dome and when we did the MRI of the seafloor where, where we're looking to see where all the wells uh, are currently on this uh, a project we reference as the, the Pangeo project we had a portable dome to be able to, to deal with this so yes we've done that um, secondly uh, how do you how do you withstand a mudslide and there's a there's there was a lot of research in this area uh, for instance uh, uh, Chevron built a platform as a fisherman uh, we were we refer to it as Brutus, and, and it's just because it was this platform that was like just big, you know short and stocky, and and all of the the conductors ran through protective the, the legs themselves. In addition to that, the pipelines themselves they've done research where they're breakaway flanges, so that if a mudslide hits a pipeline and it separates, the the, the flange actually shuts off and pinches off. Yeah, we awesome. we're using that same technology in our system because when we we put our umbilical or our, our discharge hose to suck up the oil. From time to time, um, the current gets you know wacky. We can't hold station, and and we've parted our, um, we put a weak link in our in our system, but it pinches off and we don't spill any oil. So um, there's a lot of research that has been done uh, to protect that, and and then we also implement some of it. But the real, you know, the, our, our government, they, you know, the, the government, listen, they they've done some amazing things and they've got to this point, but they got some egg on their on their face too. You know, they allowed Taylor Energy to install a, a platform called Simba three and a half miles away from this site that looks identical to this platform. And it's one of those amazing follies. Uh, a, a friend of mine has sent me some drawings. He said, man, I think I got AutoCAD drawings. And I'm like, really, AutoCAD? Because I'm, I'm, I got black and white copies. We're trying to look with a magnifying glass to get numbers because the, the other platform was so old. After this rig had gone down, they allowed Taylor Energy to, to install the same mirror uh, in there, so so you know, does the, the risk still exist? Yes, um, but um, we got a system that can capture capture it. <laughs> Just call us up. <laughs> Who are you gonna call? Oil busters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all the way in the back row there. Hi there. Um, I'm wondering, given the likelihood that there will be more accidents like this in the future. Um, are there any discussions in the government about changing the policy about having the oil company be the responsible party and take and, and, and take the lead in this, given what we saw Taylor did and the chance of that happening again in the future? I'll turn this one over to Pat. Well, I think one of the problems here is that the level of sophistication involved in addressing what happened here is something that rests not exclusively with big oil, but they have the lineup of people like Dr. Canelli who are the best and brightest at handling decision making when they're confronted with a situation like this. So at some level, there needs to be a reliance on the, on the oil companies because they have the knowledge and the wherewithal. I can tell you uh, a couple of years ago, I handled a case involving an explosion in Houston at the uh, ITC storage facility. It was a big fire on the Houston Ship Channel. And the FOSC, the Federal On-Scene Coordinator, and the team of federal agencies responsible for 
overseeing what's being done by the responsible party, in that case, ITC, was absolutely amazing. You, we had uh, meetings with the ITC people upstairs in a boardroom, and on the way down, the risk manager said, would you like to see our federal on-scene coordinator and the, and the team? And I said, sure. And so he opens a door, and there is a storage warehouse where all the inventory has been removed, and there were fold-out banquet tables with about 100 government representatives. They brought their own refrigerators in for their cold drinks. They keep very close track of what their expenses are. The responsible party has to foot the bill for all of that. And the government will load up on experts and people to be involved in working side by side with, uh, with the oil companies. Should there be a level of distrust? Look, in an ordinary case, I think everybody has a shared interest in stopping a pollution. The novelty here is once that fund was set up, it became like an irresistible urge to try to get that money. And so the behavior model changed. And the trying to dish stories that you just couldn't even believe someone would say uh, is something that they were willing to do. Filing lawsuits and trying to intimidate people is something that they were willing to do. That's the oddity of this case. In an ordinary spill event, everybody wants to stop the spill. And, and even like from a financial incentive, if you believe oil companies are bad, okay, but they are going to get caned for having a big spill. They have huge penalty exposure, uh, the $3,000 a barrel. We have another element of damages in, in American law called NERDA damages, where ultimately the federal government will measure the environmental impact down to the number of birds and turtles that were killed, and they will hit you with huge damages. So there is a built-in incentive in the structure that we have now for the oil companies to handle this the right way. So to say what he said, th there's regulations in place to protect this from happening. This was one of those anomalies, and and uh, you know I think that the rules were were there, the regulations were there to protect uh, the environment and to protect the oceans, and the government really didn't they didn't do their job as well as they should have. Got time for one more question, sir. Thank you. I was just curious, you're recovering 1,000 gallons per day now. Prior to the Hurricane Ivan, what was the production for all 28 of those wells? Because I'm curious to know what's happening. I guess the rest of the oil must have been stopped by the, the mudslide? 1,400 barrels. The platform produced 1,400 barrels a day when it went over, which, which is not that much if you compare it to the BP well, that could have been anywhere from five to 50,000 barrels a day. So um, the shallower uh, platforms don't gush like the deep, the deep ones. Thank you. All right. I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us tonight. And I, thanks especially to our distinguished speakers for the incredible presentation we saw tonight. Thank you very much. Who are the, uh, who, are the uh, who are the URI students in the room? Raise your hand, URI students. For the URI students who are present, a uh, reminder that tomorrow we have two more special sessions planned with Timmy, Kevin, and Pat tomorrow. The first, a continued discussion of public policy issues that were touched on tonight and lessons for offshore energy development in New England at 10 o'clock uh, right here in the Alumni Center. And the second, a continuation of the discussion of science and engineering touched on tonight at 1 p.m. in the Kirk Center for Advanced Technology. And then finally, the next presentation in this lecture series is on the board. I invite you all to come back for that. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Great seeing you. Take care.